us to that to try and avoid any problems and just say, you know what, you took the class, it came up, it reminded you, and you sent it in. That's your call. But three thousand dollars is what I've been told that they're getting penalties for no return. Wow. Interesting. Thank you for that. Who says uh, we can't save you money? <laughs> Well, did we, uh, yeah, shall have the right to use a precious seal. Okay. Any violation of the provisions shall subject the person to wrongfully using the precious seal and the licensee who will willfully or negligently allow such unlicensed and unauthorized person to use said seal. Keep in mind, that's only one component. If you falsify that uniform construction code permit, they can get you, we can get you under falsifying a document. So I know you guys work hard for that license. You went through a lot of schooling, a lot of continuing education. You really want to treat it as something that is special because it really is. A lot of these uh, licensees, I'm not sure understand that. But um, uh, what you guys do, as far as I'm concerned, the licensed electrical contractors um, are, are is some of the most complicated uh, codes and um, uh, types of work that's done. So you should, uh, you guys should be proud of, of obtaining that license. You should protect it. And a licensee shall immediately return to the board the previously issued official precious seal when it's been suspended or revoked, has registered with the board as inactive, uh, or the licensee's employment has been terminated, or the licensee has resigned from the business entity for which the precious seal was issued. A licensee no, uh, no, no longer holds a position as a, qualify, a qualifying licensee for the business for which the precious share was issued. Or the business said. Steve, disregard that text, just so you know. Okay. Or the business entity for which the precious CO was issued ceases to operate. The person who license, uh, whose licensee qualified a business entity to engage in the electrical contracting is rendered incapable of fulfilling his or her professional duties due to death, illness, or other conditions, the licensee or such. So a lot of this stuff here, I'm going to breeze through it. You have the right, if you decide, you're not going to remember any of this, but if you decide um, to, um, to continue to run the business, if the licensee, well, you won't because you're the licensee. Your family has the right to uh, continue the business. The business is immediately notified in writing the name of the new electrical contractor, a licensee by the board, or a qualified journeyman electrician registered with the board or other person with substantially equivalent experience. So it's going to be the board to determine whether or not this person can continue to run the business. Six month period, the business entity may complete work in progress and may contract for new work provided that all such electrical work is performed or supervised by the person. I actually used this section myself personally when um, I went to work for a private company. As a private, uh, working for a private company in New Jersey, you're not permitted to do any licensed work in the state of New Jersey. But I had projects going on. I contact the licensing board and they allowed me to finish the work. I couldn't start any new work. They sent me a letter stating that uh, any work that you are um, yeah, you have ongoing, you may finish while I work for the company. Uh, and they were very um, gracious with that. So I finished the work that I had in progress and then I closed the business. So the, again, the board uh, can be very helpful. I found that those people down there are very helpful with any of these issues. Don't be afraid to call them. I often give that uh, advice because electrical contractors think, oh, geez, the licensing board, I don't want to call them. I'm going to get in trouble. They're only going to get in trouble if they're calling you. The board may, for good cause, show extent by six months, the interim period during which electrical contracting may be performed so they can expend that. Steve, could you repeat what you said before? So if you are employed by a private contractor you cannot do work on your own license is that what you just stated 
uh, you see, you're talking about um, no. You can if you have a license, you can continue to do work under your license. If if you have a license and say, for example, you die or your business ceases, your family has a right to continue your business. But you have they have to have somebody that's qualified to continue to run the business for the period of six months. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so NJAC 1331 3.4 under the electrical contractors licensing laws. So this is the question that came up earlier. Uh, supervision of electrical work. So the licensee is required to supervise all work other than exempt electrical work. So that's the exempt work in section 10. That's the work uh, that's not required to have an electrical license that anyone can do. To ensure that such work is performed in compliance with NJAC 1331 and with the State Uniform Construction Code Act and its implementing rules set forth in the Uniform Construction Code. The other day I inspected a trench, some PVC conduit. They used a blowtorch to heat the PVC. You can clearly see it because they set it on fire. The bends kinked. Uh, they did damage to a bulkhead, all kinds of issues. Clearly, the licensed contractor was not supervising the work. Uh, you got to supervise the work that you do or that your workers do. Uh, go over the job with them, explain to them the rules. It's your license that's on the hook. If your worker decides to deviate from your instructions, it's your license that's on the hook. You, as the license holder, are required to comply with the State Uniform Construction Code Act, not the guy that's doing the work, the licensee. You have to personally inspect the work of employees. <gasps> oh, oh, my God. How about that? How many of you, by raise of hands, knew that you had to personally inspect the work? Raise your hands if you knew that. Okay, fortunately, most of you knew that. Not everybody, but most of you. you have to, you're responsible to make sure that the work is done properly. So if I get there and it fails and it's obvious, it's an obvious, it's something that's minor. Uh, a circuit breaker panel, the guy did a generator. Runs the wire, puts the ATS switch outside, main service disconnect, runs into the house, main panel, none of the grounds and neutrals are separated. They're all tied together. Clearly, the license holder did not inspect that work because that is a basic fundamental requirement. Grounds and neutral separated on the low side of the service disconnect. You got to supervise the work. Ensure that the electrical workers are afforded the degree of personal on-site supervision commensurate with their level of competence and the complexity of the work to be performed. You hide Johnny come lately, walks in there, he's got this new toolbox. Two days on the job, you send them out to a data center on a 4,000 amp service, high voltage, and you ask them to start running wires. Probably not a good idea. You want to make sure that the worker that you send on the job is capable of doing the work. Johnny, come lately, you probably shouldn't be doing motor control work and relays, disconnects, if he's never worked on the motor relays before. If all of his time is residential, don't send him in heavy commercial applications. Conversely, probably not a good idea to a guy who's always been involved in industrial work uh, to be involved in residential work because they're not familiar. That doesn't mean they can't do it. You guys are smart. I, let me tell you, a lot of the work I inspect is really professional work. Just make sure that your workers understand the work that they're supposed to do. And if not, Say, look, I'm not, I'm not comfortable doing this. And then maybe stop by and supervise them. Look, you don't have to have a degree to run wire, but uh, you have to know some of the basic codes uh, to do. I know if I inspect a job that is that uh, work is done by a guy who specializes in industrial work, he wires a residential house, I can tell. 
And you also have to be present on a regular and continuous basis at the principal office. And now we have a situation where you're charged for you receive the final inspection payment. If you read the back, in fact, I think it's coming up. I don't, I'm not sure if it's, it should be coming up on an upcoming slide. If you read the back of the yellow card that you get, most of the yellow cards printed today actually have the law citation that says you cannot accept final payment until you receive all final inspections. So this parallels the requirement here with 1331 3.2 that says if there's a code violation, you need to fix it. So let's assume I go to inspect an air conditioning system, the licensed electrical contractor installed, the disconnect, the fuses are oversized because we all know we have to look on the side of the um, unit check for maximum fuse or overcurrent protection and make sure that the fuse is sized properly. But now I open up the fuse box, I see, whoa, these fuses are oversized. The work fails. But the contract is long gone. He's got his final payment. Now that's a code violation. You have to go back and fix that for nothing. Now, most contractors are actually pretty good. They'll go back, they'll fix the violation. But keep in mind, if the homeowner complains to the licensing board, and I've had this with a homeowner, have, has called the licensing board, you're getting a, you're receiving a call. That's one thing you can guarantee, that if the board receives a complaint, you can guarantee that you're gonna be receiving a phone call and or a letter. So just keep in mind, be careful when you're doing work. If there, it, the, the law does not state the amount of money that has to remain outstanding, but you can't accept that final payment and you have to fix any code violations that exist. If I show up at a generator install and the wires are undersized, it's your responsibility to replace that wire at no cost. If you install the conductors in, uh, let's say you ran PVC in front of a garage and it's subject to damage, schedule 40, inspector shows up, nope, inspect, uh, schedule 80 is required. You cannot go back to the homeowner and say, well, the inspector made me put schedule 80 in to change out and that's gonna cost you another thousand dollars. You can't do that. If the homeowner gets aggravated and calls the licensing board, you're gonna be called on the carpet for it. So just be careful about that. Failure uh, to comply with the formally mentioned requirements. Kevin, you got a question? Uh, do we answer your question? You have a question mark out there. No, that's if it, if this applied to existing non-conforming things that they want you to change. No, if are you are talking about like, say, for example, in the air conditioning system? More, more like a renovation, you know, you see something, inspectors come up, come up, pick up on stuff that you didn't do and they say, oh, that's existing non-conforming, I want to change. You know, I didn't bid to change that. Yeah, well, that's a great point. So in my contracts, on the bottom of the contract. Now, this is not a contracting licensing class. Uh, a, um, I'm sorry, this is not a contract class. We are pointing out your requirements that you're supposed to have in your contracts, which is coming up. But in my contracts, I had information that uh, stated that if there's any additional work that I come across, uh, guys, I'm gonna have to ask, uh, everybody raise their hands, please. We're gonna finish that thought, uh, Kevin. Everybody's gotta raise their hands. Steve, Carlos, uh, oh, you got up, no, you, you were good. Raise your hands, Carlos. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, very good. All right, I'm going to lower everyone's hands. Let's see, we got calls is in twice, so you're good. So, Kevin, um, in my contracts, I had specified that if there's any work that was uncovered that was outside my scope as an electrical contractor that I had to fix that was unknown, that it would be additional work. So, uh, and it's interesting that you brought this question up because there are items in the Uniform Construction Code you are responsible to fix. So, for example, you're tying into a Let's say you're tying into an existing three gang metal box and the three gang metal box is not, now this is a minor issue, 
but just as an example, it's not properly grounded. It's an old box. It doesn't have the 1032 screw that you can screw the, the listed screw into. You're going to have to either thread something in there or you're going to have to use a listed connector somehow to ground that box. That's on you. Was it existing? Yes, the box is there. But you're tying in a conductor to, to extend a wire or maybe even put a switch light in. You're responsible to ground that box. So um, existing conforming, if the air condition was installed, you didn't touch it, you're not responsible for it. But if you're involved in it, you're responsible for it. And you might want to call a contractor. I've had this a couple of times where the contractor had called me and says, look, we got some bad issues here. It was in one of the towns I inspected. There was knob and tube wire. The entire house was ungrounded. There wasn't a grounded. The only thing that was grounded in that house was the ground, right? So in this particular case, this very astute electrical contractor called me up and says, could you meet me at the site? I got some issues here. And we went over everything and um, we talked about the the ungrounded requirements of NEC and what you can do with the knob and tube because he wasn't going back to address the knob and tube, which can remain if it's if he doesn't touch it. So don't be afraid to call your local inspector, get him over at the job site, uh, and you can discuss. No problem, Hickman. We got you. Hey, you Steve. Got yeah. Uh, I just had that. I just got contacted. Um, Anthony Conti, can you do me a favor and just raise your hand? Oh, I just lost my screen here. Yeah, Anthony Conti. Okay. Yeah, we lost Hickmet there, but he came back. Anthony, can you raise your hand, Anthony? All right, I'll take care of it. Okay. Thanks. Very good. So this serves as an example of uh, people that are not on board. Now, of course, we can't, we don't have cameras, we can't see you, but the software technology, of course, lets us know that if you're on screen or you're surfing, you know, if you're not on screen, essentially, you can't tell whether you're surfing something else, but, you know, with these virtual meetings today, um, you got to be careful because you don't want to lose the opportunity of, uh, Okay, so Anthony's going in and out. So when you when you go out, we see a triangle on our screen. When you're not uh, active on your on your end. So uh, did I answer your question about um, what you're responsible for? Was I clear on that, Kevin? Yeah, pretty much. It's put it in a contract. It's fine. Okay. Um. So failure to comply with uh, with not fixing that or charging those people requirements may be deemed occupational misconduct within the meaning of NJSA and may be subject to licensing to disciplinary action. So you want to avoid that. So at the time of the issuance of the license or as soon thereafter as deemed appropriate, the board shall furnish a pressure seal to every licensee. Uh, keep in mind that uh, that, pay, that piece of paper they give you, they'll give you uh, in the meantime, you have to provide that with all your permits. And of course you pay for it. Pressure seal shall be used exclusively by the licensed contractor in the, in, the con, uh, in the conduct of his or her practice. You can't be given out that license seal. It was funny because um, I remember it was years ago, <laughs> a contract when we actually showed up at the counter to do uh, to hand in permits. He shows up and he may have been, I don't know, 28, 29 years old. And the license number was like it was a three digit license number, seven, eight, nine or something like that. And I'm looking at the license number. I says, are you the license holder? He goes, yeah. <laughs> So not any of us who know about the licenses, they all run in consecutive order. So a license, I think, I'm not sure, maybe one of you guys know, I think the first 600 or so licenses were grandfathered, six, 700 licenses were grandfathered. Um, and so when a 28, 30 year old shows up with a seal saying he's the licensed contractor holding a three digit seal number, you know, there's something wrong. So you can't miss. So they, we could have got him on misrepresentation. 
and we could have got him on um, uh, falsifying the report, all kinds of crap. So I, I explained to the guys, look, you need to have the license contract. Against privileges, so that's the one of the, uh, I think there's one more of the last item, yeah, impending proceedings against a professional or occupational license issued by the licensee. So they can consider a number of factors in renewing your activation. Workers' compensation. So your business permit holders shall obtain the workers' compensation insurance required by the laws of the state uh, covering employees employed by the business permit holder or his subcontractor. Just so you know, uh, you're required to have workers' compensation. If you're the only contractor that has workers' compensation on the job, it's your workers' compensation that's going to cover. Business permit holders shall maintain a file, uh, on file a certificate of insurance evidencing such coverage. The business permit holders shall ensure that all temporary employees working under the supervision of the permit holders have obtained the required workers' compensation coverage. By the way, when you, uh, you might recall, when you filled out the yellow jacket, form the F-100 for, um, uh, for the uh, UCC permit, it, you're signing and certifying that you're maintaining the workers' compensation necessary for the permit. So they not only get you with the licensing law, the UCC also gets you. Every licensee who performs or supervises work subject to the Electrical Contracting Licensing Act of 1962 shall ensure the work performed is in conformity with the standards of the State Uniform Construction Code Act. That gets into, um, I didn't pick up who said that, but now we're getting into that area. So, NJSA 5227D, 119. That is the enabling statute for the Uniform Construction Code, New Jersey Statutes Annotated for Title 52. That is what creates the Uniform Construction Code, and then the Uniform Construction Code itself is embodied within the New Jersey Administrative Code, NJAC 523. It's Title V, Chapter 23, and then all the subchapters under that. You might recall um, the electrical contractor is uh, one of the subchapters. Mike, I have a question. Does this 10-hour update cover the inspector credits? Hmm. Maybe Don can answer that question. That's a good question. I believe it does. Yes. No, it doesn't. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. not allowed to. Uh, you have to take uh, UCC credits through either, um, you know, the state or you can take them through an association. Uh, because there's funding for that, we're not allowed to walk from a class that's uh, you have to pay to get it free. Hey, I'm gonna just, uh, oh, sorry, that? I'm going to just talk. I'm going to just talk real quick instead of typing, if that's all right. Um, yeah. So, th is this required for the inspector renewal for your license to be in, uh, updated for your credits, or this is not a required thing, or do you have to take this separately again through the state? No, Mike, so, your, your credits, yeah, your credits through this, are you a licensed inspector? Yes, I am. I have the ICS, HHS, and subcode. So do you but I just to, got it. I've never had to renew it. You know, I just got it like two years ago, so I'm still up another year. Yes. No, you, well, you're good. You, you, so you should have available to you for free the credits that are obtained through the Uniform Construction Code, through Rutgers DCA. Do you, oh, you okay. Have, have you been taking those classes? I haven't yet, no. Okay, so they send out a bulletin to DC. Do you get the bulletin from? Uh, yes, Rutgers? I did. I did. I did get one recently, and that's why I'm I'm kind of inquiring because that's my next step after this. I'm gonna start doing that. So you could take those classes, and by the way, if they're not filled by working officials, 
uh, you could take any class you want. Uh, and some of them are pretty interesting. You know, you could, especially now that they're virtual, you don't have to travel. It just seems to me that the interesting classes were always down Cape May or they were up in Ramsey. You know, I had to travel an hour and a half. But um, you can uh, you can take any class you want as many times as you want as long as it's not filled. So there's no limitation on that. Okay, cool. Thank you for the info. It's great. All right, you're welcome. Okay, so uh, let's see. Let's check out time here. We're a couple minutes from our break. So the so we were talking about the uh, administrative code, where the uniform construction code is. So we have, uh, in this case, you are required to supervise all those that work, that do work. Remember, we spoke about having me requiring a licensed contract to show up at a job site. Now, I don't require contractors to show up at a job site for inspections. Only when I show up and I see multiple violations and it's clear that the licensed contractor is not supervising the work. Every licensee who performs or supervises work subject to the Electrical Contractors Licensing Act of 1962 and the Uniform Construction Code shall secure permits when required and within a reasonable time after completion of the work, secure an inspection of the completed work. Just Friday, this past Friday, I issued a $3,000 notice of violation and order to pay penalty against a pool company because they installed the pool without any inspections, no collar inspections. So pools have what's called a collar inspection. It's essentially a foundation inspection, similar to like a building, a footing or a foundation is to a house, a collar inspection or pre-collar is to a pool. Not all pools require collars. Some of them can be laid on uh, prepared soil or base. That needs to be inspected. Of course, you want to make sure that the, pole doesn't, that the pool doesn't sink into the ground. That's a building inspection. Failed to call for that. Contractor, electrical contractor failed to call for the bonding inspection. He thought that he can make the bonding connections to the pool, which actually it was a non Conductive pool, but it actually came with a bonding strip attached to it. Unfortunately, he bonded to the strip of the pool and then buried it. So there were no inspections on that. The equipotential bonding grid, buried. No connections inspected. No trench inspections. Plumbing inspector, no hydro inspections on the drain. Um, drainage in pools require plumbing permits. No hydro test, no trench inspections. Uh, I was actually kind because I could have hit him for $3,000, uh, $2,000 for each. That would have been $6,000. I gave him a $1,000 penalty for each violation, much like your license. Licensing law requires each violation is treated, uh, treated separate and distinct. So he's going to wind up paying the $3,000 because he failed to call for the inspections. They now have to dig up the beautiful concrete work that they did, uh, the pads, uh, and because of the um, failure of the contractor to even call for any inspections, he essentially installed the pool with no inspections. You got to be careful with your inspections. More and more code officials are issuing penalties. In fact, under the law, somebody have a question? No? We're compelled to issue penalties. Be careful with this. Uh, you have to secure the permits. You have to secure the inspections. I talked about the other guy that got a $6,000 penalty. He walked in with a $6,000 check. Um, this is becoming more and more prevalent. It's not like it was years ago. Neighbors call. Believe it or not, a lot of the times, we don't send code inspectors out to drive around looking for dumpsters. I would say about 60% of our complaints actually come from the neighbors. If you can believe that, if they see a truck in the driveway, they call up the building department. Hey, does this guy got neighbors now? Maybe they're Snoopy neighbors. Just keep that in mind. So it's your responsibility to supervise those workers, obtain the permits, obtain the inspections. Every licensee shall be responsible for correcting within a reasonable time and at no additional charge to the customer, any code violation discovered in the work performed or supervised by the licensee. 
And by the way, with the prior slide, if you're not sure of what inspections are required, call up the local enforcing agency. There are mandatory inspections, such as trench inspections, that are required as provided in NJSA 45.5A9. So sometimes I have projects, not often because I know electrical contractors are busy and it's coming up, they do have a right to supervise X number of people, it's up to 10, but sometimes if uh, it appears that a lot licensed electrical contractors are not keeping up with their employees or their jobs, and I would require the electrical contractor to be on the job, the guy that's actually holding the license and business permit, so I can talk with him about what's going on in, uh, in the project. So keep in mind, you have the obligation to make sure that you have in your possession your business permit identification. You get that little card. Every licensee, qualified journeyman, electrician, and business permit holder shall give notice to the board of any change of his or her address of record within 10 days of such change. Service of an administrative complaint or other process initiated by the board, the attorney general, or, or the division of consumer affairs at the address of record shall be deemed adequate notice for any inquiry or dis disciplinary proceeding. So keep in mind, the reason for the address is so they can properly serve you. If you don't change your address and they serve that address, it's considered served. You have limited time as to when you can appeal any of this. So you wanna be careful that your address is accurate. You want anything that comes from the board. A licensee who has been terminated or has resigned from his or her position as a qualified licensee or business uh, shall immediately notify the board of such termination or resignation. And this is obvious, right? Uh, for, um, uh, I believe it was Ronnie, right? Ronnie quits. They're out of a licensed contractor. They got X number of vans driving all over the state with his name on it and his license number on it. The board needs to know that. And you as the license holder should be notifying the board, hey, I no longer am with this company and my name and license number is all over the state in New Jersey. A licensee shall immediately notify the board of any change in the name of electrical contracting business in which he or she is engaged as the qualifying licensee. The board shall send a notice of renewal for each licensee at least 60 days prior to the expiration of the license and the renewal shall explain inactive renewal and, adv and advise the licensee of the option to renew as inactive. Hey, hey Steve. Yes, John. On that note uh, that you're talking about this line right here, I had a contractor um, and it just came up where his license, he was his, he had another company hold his license. Okay, big outfit. And then they broke apart. The company still had the license. This guy paid taxes to the state of New Jersey, produced all the documents, was doing a, a big project. It was flagged because his paperwork wasn't in order. I hate to say it that way, but his paperwork wasn't in order, albeit he produced all the documents except the board didn't have the proper change back to just him. He broke away from that company. He had to hire an expediter to get this resolved, to move this project forward with a national outfit. It cost him $10,000 to get that resolved. I just wanted to make that note. Wow, great story. 10,000 bucks, and not to mention probably legal fees. And God only knows what happens. Even if you if, if it wasn't really an, a major issue, just to defend yourself, not to mention the aggravation. So you want to try to keep on top of, of uh, this information. It really is not much if you spend some time and you understand what your role is. And I've always found, I've had questions throughout my career. I called the licensing board and they were always very helpful. The people down there are looking to help the electrical contractors obtain whatever paperwork or clarify any paperwork they need clarified. However, if there's a complaint, that role stops and it, it protects the consumer. But don't be afraid to call the licensing board. Those people down there are very helpful. 
If the notice to renew is not sent within 60 days prior to express expiration date, no monetary penalties or fine shall apply to the holder for failure to renew, provided that the licensee is renewed within 60 days. So if you don't get the notice, call them. A licensee shall renew his or her license for a period of three years. You got to pay the fees. And a licensee may, upon application to the board, renew his or her licensee by choosing inactive status. So you can declare your license inactive. Keep in mind, you need to continue with the CEUs. Because when they ask you for them, you need to have them. Otherwise, they'll revoke your license. A licensee electing to renew his or her licensee as inactive shall not engage in the practice of electrical contracting or hold him or herself out as eligible to engage in the practice of electrical contracting in New Jersey. So if you guys, for whatever reason, you wanted to take a leave of absence, you want to take, um, you know, you decide to just hold it up for medical reasons, you can declare your license inactive. But generally, that's a long period of time because you do have three years. Uh, so uh, just know that that option is available to you. If a licensee does not renew the license prior to its expiration date, the licensee may renew the license within 30 days of its expiration by submitting a renewal application. Okay, these are just some uh, options. They're, the board's pretty good. They'll send out the notices and you'll have pretty much clear options to either renew or not renew and declare an active. So a licensee who fails to submit a renewal application within 30 days of a license expiration shall have his or her license suspended without a hearing. A licensee who continues to engage in the practice of electrical contracting with a suspended license shall be deemed to be engaging in the unauthorized practice of electrical contracting and shall be subject to action even if no notice of suspension has been provided to the individual. Licensee who holds an inactive license may apply for the board for reactivation. So you have to submit the renewal application certification of the employment listing for each job held during the period of inactive license status, the renewal fee, and the CEU certificates. So that means for you guys that are in this class that have inactive licenses, these are the CEUs that you're earning now. You want to keep these certificates to show if in the event you renew your uh, licensing and business permit that you've been continuing your educational units. Okay, so depending on how long you've been out of it, they can uh, do all kinds of things, make you pass uh, tests, uh, take tests, pass tests, refresh your courses. Uh, show of hands, how many guys in this class have inactive licenses? One, okay. I'm going to lower your hand so you can have the license reactivated. I think we're. And it can restore the license subject to the applicant's completion of the training within a period of time if they even decide to make you do that. And they can make you. Um, uh, so there's a lot of factors that they consider length of duration of the license was an active employment history, professional history disciplinary history, any action against the applicant's license. By the way, how many guys in this class need additional CEUs? Of this class, is this going to satisfy the 34 CEUs? Raise your hands if you do not have enough CEUs after this class. One, two, three, four, Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven guys. Okay. I'm going to lower your hands. How many guys 
have uh, are already registered or you're going to fall short raise your hand if you're going to fall short of, of uh, foods as part of your experience now um keep in mind these slides here are really um these are a lot of this is not verbatim out of the law a lot of this is watered down some of the language was changed to eliminate a lot of the um cross citations in there uh you should spend a little bit of time reading the actual statutes it's not very long but uh it's important you understand it but these uh, these will give you some of the important facets that you really should uh, take away from this applicants have the option of establishing the satisfaction of the board the applicant has necessary educational background so obviously i think we have we may have some um some individuals that do not yet have their license maybe some journeymen so you have to establish a necessary educational background and experience to qualify to take the examination for a license and there's your 34 credits of continuing education the ceus that are required and one of those of course is the law which you're in now so every three years you have to do this by march 31st which by the way is in two days <laughs> No person shall be denied the privilege of continuing a business as an electrical contractor in the event of death, illness, or other physical disability of the license for at least six months. And it must be conducted under qualified supervision. This is actually a very important provision. Uh, my first boss that I did my, um, my apprenticeship had passed away and he, he was a an active elect, electrical contractor his son got involved in the business so you if if you have an an active business you should have the right and you do to continue that to at least finish the jobs that you currently have in front of you and the law gives you that right no licensee or business permit issued under this act shall be assigned or transferable when you die the license and permit dies it's not transferable if you have a son or daughter and they want to take uh take over the business they have to obtain a license and a business permit now there are there are other options they can uh, partner with another company but they still need the license and business permit any person who engages in any conduct in violation of any provision of an act or regulation shall in addition to any other sanctions provided herein a penalty so you got ten thousand for the first violation twenty thousand for the second and each subsequent fortunately i was never called in front of the board so i can't speak from personal experience i would never want to be called in front of the board um so you want to try to avoid that at all costs each act in violation of any provision of an act or regulation administered by a board could constitute a separate violation and be deemed a second or subsequent violation. So what they're saying here is if they deemed you to be doing um, upselling and they also said that your upselling was excessive price gouging, that's two separate violations. That's not one, even though they're related. And the attorney general may bring action and such action may be brought in summary manner pursuant to penalty enforcement law of 1999. So the penalty enforcement law of 1999 is actually the law that we use as construction officials to go after homeowners and contractors that fail to take out permits or call for inspections or if or for any reason penalties are issued against them, we use this same law. Uh, and it's really a summary judgment. So remember, uh, some of this, has you have a right to administratively appeal. If you do not administratively appeal and it goes to summary judgment, you're not arguing your case there, you're paying the penalty. It's just a matter of how much. Process in such action may be a summons or warrant. And in the event that defendant in such action fails to answer such action, the court shall, upon finding an unlawful act or practice to have been committed by the defendant, issue a warrant for the defendant's arrest. You can be ordered to pay the civil penalties. And um, you can 
be ordered to restore any person of interest, any monies or property acquired. So you get the point of where this law goes. It's the law is not designed to protect you. That's the very first thing that I learned. It's not designed to protect you. The law is designed to protect the consumer. A board or court may order the payment of costs for the use of the state. So you're not only paying their costs, you're paying the state's costs and the board's costs. Okay, so the Board of Electrical Contractors, this is NJAC. So unlike the statute, this is an administrative code. The administrative code gets its authority from the statutes. So NJAC, New Jersey Administrative Code, Title 1331 1.5. You might remember yesterday when we went on the building site, we were able to go on LexisNexis and search the administrative site. So um, for the um, building code, it was uh, Title right 523. Well, you could do the same thing here, 1331. But keep in mind these are also on the site that I showed you yesterday, the New Jersey uh, State Electrical Contractors Licensing Board site. So the identification of licensee and permittees, vehicles, stationary advertising. So your commercial vehicles have to be visibly marked with all of the following information. It's got to have the name of the licensed electrical contractor in lettering. It's got to be at least three inches in height. The words electrical contractor business permit number or electrical contractor business permit number in that form followed by the business permit number, minimum three inches in height. See, unlike some other contractors, you guys are actually licensed. So do you ever drive down a road and you see a home improvement contract? It says license number, HV, and it goes on. Actually, that's false advertising. That's not a license number. It's actually a registration number. So where the space is limited either by design of the vehicle or by the, pre uh, the presence of other legally specified identification markings, the size of the lettering shall be as close to three inches uh, or high, as high as possible. <clears throat> uh, provide the name is clearly visible and, read and readily it actually should be readable. So you want to be able to read the license number. You don't want to create a problem. Now, I remember when I first became a licensed contractor, uh, this seemed to be a lot more prevalent. When we took the classes, we had more contractors um, brought to task, it seems. Henderson, you got a question? You got your hand raised. Henderson Husbands. I like that name. No? Okay. So um, by show of hands, I'm interested in this question. Uh, by show of hands, how many of you guys have ever been questioned on stationary or your trucks uh, or, the, or a claim that you haven't been advertising the way you should be? Oh, a couple of guys. Oh, all right. Anybody want to share that story? You don't have to, not mandatory. A local town just pulled me over, and I guess for money, they said that my signs weren't correct. They weren't sized right, weren't placed right. Really? Yeah. Was that, was that the, um, the code department, building department? Uh, no, that was police department. <laughs> no, I was just passing through the town. Wasn't even in a, in a driveway, just driving. And they had a checkpoint, and I, for whatever reason, that's what they got me for. How about that? Now that I never heard of. The chief of police, he wasn't a, a part-time construction official, was he? I have no idea. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah this, is, yeah, this is Carlos. I have gotten maybe like three tickets on my uh, trucks for not having a uh, sign by police or not being the proper size. So uh, if police sees a commercial vehicle, you made a big sure you have a... a, a a sign on it. If it falls off, you have one of those magnetic, they'll pull you over and give you, I think it's a couple hundred dollars to take that again. 
Yeah, interesting. So some uh, interesting information. So if you guys out there, make sure you contract your your signs, your signage, uh, even your letter 